A government lab has come up with a new technology to track down the source of tainted foods. The goal is to limit or prevent foodborne illness. To do this, scientists have created particles comprised of sugar and non-living and non-viable DNA. They call it DNA tracks. One report from Innovation Now says the DNA tracks will act like an invisible barcode that can be sprayed on our food. It's an odorless and tasteless substance, and the Food and Drug Administration says it won't harm us. Technology and consumer privacy expert Katherine Albrecht joins us now with more on this. Dr. Albrecht, when you hear this will reportedly serve as an invisible barcode, does that concern you? Well, the industry has been looking for ways to track food as a response to the, the trouble with foodborne illness. And I think no one will deny that this is a real problem. Um, many experts argue that this is a real problem because the conditions in factory farms, in, in mass production, may not be as sanitary as they should be. But I think moving to uh, kind of a spray on DNA is an example of what I like to call burden shifting, which is really place, placing a, a, a sort of a new tracking and privacy burden potentially on consumers. Consumers. And it, it may be difficult to kind of see the connection. So let me see if I can explain this. I've actually spent many years fighting against a technology called RFID that we call spy chips. And actually, I have a book by that name about it. Um, RFID technology or radio frequency ID technology was originally developed as a way to track products in warehouses. And there was an initiative a number of years back to replace the barcode with it so that all objects could be traceable. And traceability with objects, while it may sound like a good idea, presents a huge huge privacy problem for consumers because what it makes possible would be, for example, a, a, a banana peel tossed by the side of the road, you could literally scan the banana peel, get its unique DNA number, track it back to a consumer frequent shopper card, and figure out which consumer purchased the banana and maybe issue them a littering ticket for, for tossing it out the window. I think a bigger concern is when we get into the, the area of big brother and surveillance in government, the potential for someone to actually be able to pick up any object in your house, whether it's an item of food, whether it's a pen, whether it's something else that has had this technology applied to it, and determine where you bought it, when you bought it, or if it was some in someone else's home or was given to you as a gift, who bought it for you, where they bought it, what they paid for it. All of this becomes possible once you can apply something that individually identifies the object and makes it trackable, not only through the food chain, not only through the retail supply chain, but literally through the chain of sort of us exchanging objects with one another as Christmas gifts, anniversary presents, you name it. And I think it just opens a can of worms. DNA tracks can also be used to hunt down the producers of fraudulent food like mislabeled olive oil using similar tracking methods. Does this level of tracking have troubling applications? Well, I think once you're, first of all, we haven't really had uh, huge problems with that, I think, to the extent that we're having issues with, with other things. The problem, and, and what that immediately brings to mind, for example, is the recent studies that show that a lot of the uh, pharmaceuticals and herbal products being brought in from China may not actually contain the things in question. And I, while, while it may seem tempting to ask somebody in the supply chain to spray on the DNA, I have real concerns, and I'll, I'll, I'll just name a few of them. When we saw the frequent shopper card introduction, which I actually wrote my Harvard dissertation dissertation about the privacy implications of those cards because they enable them to track all your food purchases. There were vast and wonderful promises made by the supermarkets that in the event you got tainted food, how easy it would be, they would know where it came from, they'd know who you were. If there was a bad batch of something, they could contact everyone who had purchased it. And there have actually been a number of lawsuits against the supermarkets because they didn't do that at all. That would be very expensive and time consuming and difficult. So while it provided a reassurance for consumers, they actually didn't act on it in the long run. My concern is if we're sourcing things in from other countries, how reliable is that actually going to be? And do we really want to solve the problem in a way that creates additional problems for us? Um, I'm, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm feeling uneasy about it from uh, just a shopper perspective. I founded an organization called Consumers Against Supermarket Privacy Invasion and Numbering, or CASPIN. And the, I think the deeper they get into tracking individual products and individuals who purchase those products, I think the deeper they're going to get into every aspect of what we buy and, and what we do. Switching to another story now, in Venezuela, we're hearing that a new form of payment is being accepted or rather enforced in food markets. Tell us a little bit more about that. 
Well, in Venezuela, they have socialist policies that were instituted by the former president, Hugo Chavez. And those policies have really led to a lot of economic devastation in the country. When you put in place price controls, you get shortages. And they've been dealing with those for a number of years with food. So what they did is something I predicted about 15 years ago, that the frequent shopper cards that have been now placed into most retail stores across the country, or at least many, and that over 95 percent of Americans are using without thinking, are tracking their purchases. In Venezuela, they realized this, and what they did was they actually, it was over a year ago, they began requiring people, instead of scanning a frequent shopper card, to scan their Venezuela government ID. And when that wasn't enough, when people began exchanging IDs, they're now demanding that people present a fingerprint so they can be ID'd. And the way the system works, and it's disturbing, they've combined the frequent shopper club card records or the purchase records of all the stores in Venezuela. So if you go to store A on Monday, and buy a gallon of milk, and that's your family's ration. And then your husband goes to a store, or your, in your case, your wife goes to a store on Tuesday and tries to buy milk, or maybe on Friday at a different store. The store will say, hang on a second, you're Mark Martin's wife. He already bought milk on Monday. You are going to have to put that back on the shelf. So an actual alarm or sort of a notice sounds at the checkout, says you have to put these items back because you've reached your limit. And so identifying people and, and linking them to their purchases, I think, is uh, a definite road to rationing and control and restricting what people will be able to buy. Okay, consumer privacy advocate, Dr. Katherine Albrecht, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Mark.